money, and that is in the credit card merchant processing fees. In 2021 alone, we, my practice, paid five figures in these fees, and I'm a small practice. Now, if there's some way to cut that down, I am all for it. I'm very excited to have today's guest, Cheryl McKenna of Merchant Advocate, to share her knowledge on how to reduce these costly fees. Now, don't let her youthful appearance fool you. She has been in the credit card processing industry for close to 25 years. As always, if you have any questions while watching this live or on the replay, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being able to talk to all of you guys today. So thank you for the invitation. All right. So if you can give us a quick 30-second elevator pitch of exactly what do you do at Merchant Advocate? Yes. So we help business owners lower the cost of accepting credit card payments without changing merchant providers. So we are not a merchant provider. We work with your existing program to find every little profit leak in that merchant services program and fix what's costing you to pay too much money. That's a great. That's a great thirty. That's a great thirty second uh, uh, summary. Now, for those who don't know, what are uh, how, how does a credit card work in general? I mean, you got. I I just know that credit card is right there, and okay, so. There's a bank name on there. There's MasterCard and Visa. Give us a little synopsis of how that transaction takes place. Yeah. So for as as consumers, it's really easy. We carry this piece of plastic in our wallet. We go someplace or we go online. Um, we pay using that piece of plastic. Um, we hopefully pay off our balance at the end of every month and don't accrue interest. Um, but there are so many players in the background of us buying something with that piece of plastic. So when I started in the merchant industry many years ago, um, and I just basically took a job, I was done with college, needed a job, happened to start working for a merchant services company, really had no idea what it was. But I remember the first day that we had actual training and we went into the training room and they had this whiteboard up. And it was the life cycle and all the players of a credit card transaction. And I looked at that and I thought, I am never going to understand this. <laughs> so there's so many different players in this game. Um, there's the card brands, sometimes called card associations, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. That's what we have in this country. Um, occasionally, like if you go to Hawaii, you might, you might see JCB. Um, then there are the banks that issue the credit card. So if you pull credit cards out of your wallet and look, could be on the back, could be on the front, but there's a, there's a bank that has issued that card to you. Some of the common ones are Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Capital One, Citibank, all the way down to your, you know, smaller regional banks, even some state chartered banks. So there's that. Then there are the merchant service providers. They're the ones who facilitate the transaction from the merchant. So the business um, to, you know, they have to route it. They have to set up with a processor. And then the, that processor has to route that transaction to their customers or their patients um, card issuing bank, right? Why? What do they have to know? Is your card good or not when you're paying for goods or services? Um, so, and then of course, for you all, um, with what you do, you have credit card terminals. A lot of times you have credit card terminals at your place of business. So then there's the equipment and then there's the software. There's just, and then think about this. With every person that I've described, except for the business owner or the, the patient or the customer, every single one of those players gets money for that credit card transaction. So there's so much money going back and forth and changing hands with these 
with these transactions and think of how, what percentage of the United States commerce is conducted by credit card. Hardly anyone's carrying cash. And by the way, there's a national coin shortage. And who wants to carry a checkbook and write a check? It takes too long. So, yeah. It's convenience. It's so convenient yes. to just have a credit card on file. It's so convenient to just have a credit card on Amazon.com, for instance. And then all I have yep. to do is one click buy and then I'm done. So mm -hmm. the ubiquity of credit card use is undeniable. Now, it sounds like what you're saying is that every at every stage of the game, somebody is taking a cut out of the transaction. So for yes. for for me to accept as a, as a merchant as a practice, if I take accept payment for a hundred dollars on a credit card, depending on the amount of money that the amount the percentage that is being charged, I don't get a hundred dollars. I might get I may get ninety six or ninety seven dollars, and then you are getting charged two, three, sometimes four percent of whatever the charged amount is. So yes, that that's where a lot of people don't understand that they they think, well, I'm I'm getting a hundred bucks and I'm actually pocketing a hundred bucks. Nope, there are a lot of middlemen who are mm -hmm. taking a piece, uh, just a small piece. And when you you know, for those of you who actually look at these merchant processing <laughs> company statements, you'll you'll yeah. it's it's bewildering the number of charges that are on there. Yes. Yes, it's definitely bewildering. So I would I just this morning, um, I talked to James in North Carolina, and he owns a um, it's Carolina wine merchant. So he really markets to the high end wine drinker. And um, I actually wrote down what he said, because it was so funny. And I was like, Oh, I'm totally gonna use this. But he said, um, it's a racket with these guys. They purposely make this statement with all of this. And he said, BS, and you can't understand any of it. He said, I feel like I would need a degree in merchant services to understand it all. And I was like, well, I have a degree in merchant services. Cause like you said, despite the fact that I only look 25, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. So. Yeah, For me, it's fun. Statements are fun. I love looking at statements. Well, I'm because, glad. Yeah, I'm glad there are data geeks like you who enjoy looking at statements. Yeah, and those statements, I can look at your statement and I can figure out what it is that you're not doing correctly. Um, sometimes, to you know, there's just small changes that can be made to lower the cost that businesses are paying to accept those credit cards. And it, so all those acronyms, actually the information contained in those, so we can really drill down into the statements is fascinating. Um, it, it gives us a lot of clues of how to lower your costs. It's all contained in there. You just have to know how to, how to decode it. So the, I think in general, there are in in essence, th in essence, three buckets of fees, right? You have the interchange fees, you have yep. the assessment fee, and then you have the processor fee. So among the three, which one can you most negotiate? Well, sometimes it's hard to tell which is which on the statement, right? Interchange is something. So with interchange, you have to be set up correctly with your processor, number one. And you really have to be optimizing the way in which you accept those um, transactions. So for instance, you mentioned, oh, it's just so easy to have card on file. Well, a lot of practices, especially with the pandemic, a lot of practices have decided they want to go touchless. And so they are holding a lot of the credit cards on file. And when a patient comes in, um, they might not even request that someone ha physically hand over a credit card, right? It's convenient. No one has to touch anything, et cetera, et cetera. But that's one of the more expensive ways for a practice to accept a credit card. Visa and MasterCard charge more for that at American Express and Discover. They charge more for a sale if a mag stripe hasn't been swiped through a terminal 
or there's no uh, credit card chip red, right? You got to insert the card uh, for the chip. There's also tap to pay, right? Apple pay, Google pay. Anytime you have a patient in front of you, have them hand over the credit card and physically let you, you have to let Visa, MasterCard, American Express and Discover know that that card was physically at the location. That's the way to get the lowest cost um, when it comes to interchange, right? So the less you swipe, the more you vault, the higher your costs are. So the now cost, there, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was going to say there are definitely times when card vaulting is fantastic. And I recommend to all of my clients that they use a processor that allows you to vault the credit card, because if the patient isn't in front of you and you need to collect payment, it, as long as they've agreed that you can hold their card on file and let's face it, most people will, because they're used to it. We all have our cards on Amazon. Like I, my, all my stuff is in Google. So whether it's my phone or my computer or my tablet, anytime I want to buy something, I just, you know, it, it comes up the list of my cards. So it is convenient, but be careful. A lot of the processors won't tell you that it costs you more to vault that credit card. So when you say vault, I think a lot of people may not understand vault. Vault means oh, credit card on file. Right. It like means credit keep, card keeping... on file, but securely. Secure. Yes, of course. There's a mm -hmm. lot of compliance. Yeah, we, we won't go down that rabbit hole. But there's there are a lot of compliance things that you have to do when you keep patients or customers' credit card on file. Mm -hmm. But when you what you're saying is whenever the card is not physically being either chipped or swiped, it costs the merchant, you, the the practice, more money because you're assuming, or the credit card company is assuming a greater amount of inherent risk because yes. how do they know that this is not some number that you just got off the internet through the dark web and you are now charging some unknown person this transaction amount? So exactly. whenever you can, you want to physically swipe. Even though you have the credit card on file or vaulted, You, if the patients are right in front of you, you want to get that card, swipe it or chip it, it ends up costing your practice less money. Yes, and, and it can be up to 0.8% less money. So that, that really adds up. If you think of all the volume that you're putting through um, your, your practice in terms of credit cards and multiply that by 0.8, that, that can be a huge loss right off your bottom line if you're not swiping or chipping as much as you can. And I'm just going to call it swipe. I've, that's how long I've been in the industry. It, it used to just be mag strips. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I, still called a swipe. <laughs> it, swipe or chip or, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. There swipe now. means swipe, chip, tap. You know, you and then it. there's, you know, there's the tap to pay. I just set up my tap to pay. I'm assuming you know, like you're a tech guy, right? I'm sure you've had your tap to pay set up for quite some time, right? Yep. We do have tap to pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I personally mm -hmm. use it whenever possible, but not all cards have that feature. No. So this, the, the other thing, the other thing that some people may not understand is that depending on a type of credit card that is used, the merchant, the practice will get charged varying amounts. Can you discuss that a little bit? Exactly. So I, I want to, first of all, if you decide that you're going to accept credit cards, you have to accept every card that someone hands to you. So if you say, yes, I'm going to accept MasterCard, you have to accept every MasterCard, right? It doesn't matter what type of card it is, but um, so and, and a lot of times it's hard to tell what type of card is being given to you, but rewards cards. So rewards cards are cards that will give us, and we love these cards as consumers, right? Yes, I definitely. love my Southwest, you know, airline miles credit card for sure. Um, but the card brands aren't giving you these rewards like airline miles, cash back, you know, they have them for everything. Disney cruises, Hilton hotels, like every major chain also has, there's probably even like a Panera credit card. I don't know. But. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. Everywhere you go, they're like, you want to, no, I don't want Starbucks. It. But, yeah. um, 
but the, the, the card brands aren't giving the consumers these rewards out of the goodness of their heart. They are charging the businesses more money every time we go to this business and pay with a rewards card. So that's one example. Um, another example is business cards, um, also referred to as purchasing cards and corporate cards. Now, you guys don't necessarily run into, say, a patient paying with a business card or a corporate card, but is there anyone out there that's accepting um, reimbursement from the insurance company via a virtual credit card? So that's probably the most expensive card that a practice can accept. So that's the most that, that's one of the what well, that's one of those subtle egregious things that insurance companies do, and it just irks me. It pisses me off because the practice has already provided a service, and then these insurance companies they can set up their own arrangements with credit card companies or whatever. They issue this credit card as a form of payment or reimbursement to practices, and so when practices who are unaware they take that credit card payment, what what are they doing? They're taking a discount off of whatever it is that they're they're mm -hmm. taking. So if they get yeah. if they get paid a hundred bucks by the insurance company, they just took a haircut of two, three, four percent, and that mm -hmm. money part of it is going right back to the insurance companies. So I yes. tell all the practices just say no to these virtual credit cards because you're getting screwed once by accepting insurance, and you're getting screwed again by taking payment using a virtual credit card. Mm -hmm. Yes. And interestingly, so I always imagine that like the card brands all went golfing and they thought, let's think about like what's billions and billions of dollars that's going through the economy and we are not capturing any of it, you know, and maybe after the six hole in a beer or two, they're like, I got it, insurance. And so they created an incentive program for the insurance companies to pay you all by credit card. That's what they did. They figured it out, they marketed it, and they sold it. And they did a great job. And they are essentially rewards cards for the insurance company. So yes, at you, I can see those line items on merchant statements. I know who's accepting insurance. V, I call them VCCs, virtual credit cards, VCCs. Um, and, and there are clients that come to me and, and I say, are you taking re you know, reimbursement um, by VCC from the insurance? Cause, and they're like, no. And I'm like, really? Because I see this line item, MC corporate data rate one <laughs> on your statement. And it turns out that maybe they've had like um, a, a staff change at that position. Oh my gosh, are we all having problems with staffing right now? Absolutely. Is there a lot of turnover? Absolutely. So, you know, these are things I look at my client's statements every single month. And when, if one of these pops up, I can alert them that, hey, like there's something going on at this, you know, whoever's doing this now did not get the memo because yes, you are. And those cost at minimum, minimum 3%. So you absolutely want to avoid those at all costs. Wow. I mean, that just, <laughs> it makes me sad. So It makes me sad too. <laughs> it so, does. So, so my practice, we actually had you look at our statement. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, just because you have the possibility of saving practices, businesses money, it doesn't mean that it works for every single business. And when mm -hmm. you looked at our account, our merchant processor is doing a relatively good job. Yes, like you guys are in good shape. And the interesting thing about that is, and I look at, I don't know, maybe a thousand statements a year uh, for, for real, like a thousand statements a year probably. And, um, and those are just the new ones coming in. But like, for instance, your specific processor, like your rates were good. But I have looked at countless other statements from the same processor that you're using and the rates were not good. <laughs> so there's really no, you, you can't say, oh, 
well, we're using processor ABC and that processor is great. And everybody who's using that processor has fantastic pricing and they've been set up correctly and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really just never know. There's there's no rhyme or reason to it that I've been able to see. <laughs> it sounds like in health insurance companies, right? Same insurance <laughs> company, but yes. to do two different practices, each practice can be paid differently. Exactly. And, and, Perfect analogy. And, yeah. and even with one particular insurance, depending on the plan that is being issued to the patient, the coverage is different, the deductible is different, the family deductible is different. I guess mm -hmm. I guess that's a that's similar to what's going on. Just because I'm using one particular brand of credit card processor, you still have to be on top of them and, and make sure they're not charging you frivolous things like PCI compliance and things like that. Yes, absolutely. And can I give you like a real world example of something that just that just happened that we discovered on our um Jan our clients January merchant statements? Yes. Okay, this this is a good one. So at Merchant Advocate, we not only look over your program at the beginning and identify any areas where you're being overcharged because this is an unregulated industry. We also pull our client statements every single month and perform a line by line audit. Okay. That's these folks need to have their feet held to the fire. Your profitability needs to be protected. So around the 4th of February, we're able to access everyone's January merchant statements. And what we found is one of the it's the third largest processor in the United States. So I guarantee that some of the people that are listening to this, watching this um, have been affected, but they double build, but only on interchange. But interchange makes up the bulk of what a business owner gets charged on yes, that merchant yes, statement. Yes, yes, yes. They double build interchange and they they hadn't said a thing we we pointed out to them, I mean, we have hundreds of hundreds maybe even thousands of clients i don't know using this specific processor i personally have 91 clients using this specific processor okay so we pointed it out to them they hadn't said anything they didn't come clean about it until february 15th february 15th what if we hadn't pointed it out would it have been one of those things where will only um, reimburse you if you call us up because you've noticed it, right? Here's another thing. Have you looked at the bottom of that, of those merchant statements? Because um, this, and I, I put this in here too, so I could read this to you. On the specific processor that I'm talking about, this is exactly what it says on the bottom of their statements. It says, review this statement closely verify all deposits, adjustments, chargebacks, and fees. It is the merchant's responsibility to report any error or discrepancies in writing within 90 days following the reporting period. After this time, the statement information and fees are considered to be accepted by the merchant. Done. So so, so if you if you're not looking at the statement, I mean, if you so I, I'm a I'm a pretty small practice, but if you have a large practice and you are running things correctly, you're collecting payment upfront, what the unmet deductible is, what is coinsurance, what is um, uh, copay. If you're collecting all that upfront, this is a lot of money, and a percentage of that is in your merchant processing fees. So it adds up very very quickly, and for one particular vendor to double charge the interchange fee, which as you said, it's the bulk of what yeah. we get charged because I, I don't think that's, you can you can negotiate that. That's the, that's the credit card issuing company, that's the fee. So I don't think that's negotiable. So to, to have them double charge that amount, that's, that's insane. Yes, it is. It's insane. And, and for them to not mention anything, I mean, come on, they, they had to have known, don't you think? <laughs> Yeah, well, so if the, if the, if there isn't a merchant advocate looking at these statements, or if I'm not looking at these statements every single month, I'm not physically, but my my practice administrator is, and that's how I'm able to tell you what is the percentage that we're being charged since 
pretty much when I started practice mm -hmm. <laughs> in 2006. I have a spreadsheet of charges from merchant and how much we charged and also what is the fee from the merchant. And, that, and in aggregate, annually, I'm looking at the percentage overall, all comers, right. doesn't matter what type of what type of transaction, what type of credit card, I'm looking at the overall percentage that we're being charged. But yep. unless you're doing that, you would be in the dark. Yeah, and, and you know, what you're doing is fantastic. And that's the exception rather than the norm. And, and I always tell my clients, so I work with a ton of doctors. That's that's really the bulk of, of my clients is, is doctors. So whether that's um, urologists or dentists or veterinarians or whatever. But I say they taught you how to wear the hat of doctor, but no one ever taught you how to wear the hat of CEO. And it's a CEO's responsibility to like as a doctor, you're generating revenue and you guys are really, really good at it. But a CEO makes sure that enough of the revenue stays within the business organization for it to be viable and then not just viable, but to thrive. So unfortunately, a lot of folks don't look at their statement, but then like, like James in North Carolina, he's like, I don't understand what I'm looking at anyway. So, but yeah. And then interchange again, you can look at the interchange categories and if you know what they mean, like you can identify all sorts of strange stuff. So I have a, a periodontal practice in Memphis. And when I looked at their statement, it turned out that they were coded incorrectly, but only for American express. And how would they have known that? But just that one item alone accounted for $126 a month. That was just one item. So it's little bits that add up. It really is. Death by a thousand cuts. That's what, that's what comes to mind. Exactly. So Cheryl, so. would you mind sharing other ways to save on processing costs? Mm -hmm. Like say if, if someone were to... Uh, like say they would they want to pay payment they they call in they get a statement they call into the office and now you are capturing information to enter to do a yeah. remote charge how what are some of the things that merchants can do to save on processing fees sure so definitely you want to put in the address information so of that particular client or patient and it it should be the address that their credit card company has on file, right? So you have to be specific and ask for the billing address for that credit card. Obviously, if your staff is answering the phone, that's great because they can verify either what's in your practice management software or they can ask for that information. But now a lot of people also have pay now buttons on their website. Right. And so when you send out statements or whatever, or if someone owes, they go to your website and they'll pay. Now, on the website, there's going to be a payment form. Make sure you work with your processor and your IT firm to ensure that the billing information is a, their required fields. Right. Because what if someone just doesn't feel like putting them in? So you want to make sure those are required because. Again, like we talked about risk. So there's levels of risk. Card present, very low risk. There's, there's not much chance that that's going to be a stolen card, right? You're there, you're handing it to someone. Okay, so the next level is card not present, address verified. So that's going to be more expensive than card present, but the most expensive is card not present, no address verified. So if, if you are having to accept card not present payments, please, please, please train your staff to put in that address information to verify it with the customer, with the patient, and also to be very clear that this is going to be the billing address of the credit card. Okay. Because just for instance, in my town, um, and I work with um, quite a few of the practices, but it specifically, um, my orthodontist, when he showed me his 
merchant services statement, I was like, look at all these line items on here. You guys aren't capturing address information. He's like, yeah, we are. But guess what? Everyone that lives downtown, the downtown is really old. You have to go to the post office. You have a PO box that has a different zip code. Something that they wouldn't have thought about. They were capturing the address information. They weren't capturing the correct, <laughs> they weren't capturing the billing address. So it must be the billing address. Yeah, definitely. Now, okay, so that's one thing. So capturing the line item information is really, really important. Uh, address, billing address, specifically billing address and correct billing address. And also maybe if you, if you need the CVV, the three-digit code, capturing that w would be a good idea, right? Well, the CVV won't change the price that you pay oh, I for didn't your know merchant that. processing. The CVV is designed to... Okay, so if you steal a credit card, there's a really good chance then you don't have the physical card because most, most credit card theft occurs in the cyber realm, right? Correct. So dark web, dark uh, web. I can just yeah. 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 These guys go in and they attack like target server or whatever. Yes. They get all this information. Yes. So the C V V was really designed and it's it's I think it it might go away at some point in time, but it was designed so that if someone calls and pays and you get all the information and you say, well, what's the C V V? That they're looking at their credit card. So it's their credit card. They're looking at it. They turn it over and they read the code on the back. So that was supposed to make it a less risky sale. And therefore the card associations have less of a chance that they're going to have to reimburse us as a consumer when our credit card gets stolen and used. Because if our credit card gets stolen and it's in the cyber realm, CVVs are never ever stored in a card vault situation so you wouldn't have the cvv got it if that so, makes sense yeah 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 basically the yeah. the insurance insurance or not insurance companies but uh, credit card companies want to mitigate mitigate risk and that cvv is just another way to decrease the risk of that particular transaction yes now you should still get the cvv though because if if a patient disputes services or something like that ah. and it was a hand entered sale ah. and you don't have the cvv it's a reason for them to say nope i'm sorry you lose that dispute because you didn't enter in everything you should have on that sale but i just wanted to make clear that you know not to get into the weeds but it won't save you money but it it lowers your risk of than having a chargeback charge and back. losing that chargeback. Charge back. Yes, that's right. Exactly. That's right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So what else? Um, let's say at the end of the day, when should I, when should I finish with my credit card things? Well, most credit card terminals nowadays. I mean, almost every type of either virtual terminal or physical terminal will auto batch. So it is set to auto batch because you must close out your batch no later than 24 hours after you've taken that first transaction. And, and the reason why for that, again, mitigating risk, what if somewhere along the way you've gotten an approval for these transactions and then a credit card does get stolen? Well, you've got the approval, but now they have to pay you for a card that's really no good anymore. So yes, you must batch out within 24 hours and I would bet that maybe even a hundred percent of the people uh, watching this, their their equipment auto batches. We so. we we certainly hope so. Yeah. I mean, there are there are there are some medical practices and urology practices that still don't have a website, no online presence. So it wouldn't surprise me if their terminals are not PCI compliant or if they're not using a secure payment application or gateway, which is risky for them and also costs more money, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, sometime we should get a little bit into the weeds of PCI compliance and the overlap with the HIPAA security rule. I'd love to talk to you guys about Next that. Next webinar. It's a, fascinating com <laughs> it's a fascinating topic for me and it's really critical for you guys. And most people don't even know about it, don't know they haven't achieved compliance and it can be a big problem if you have a breach. And, so. uh, and I hope people are using the up-to-date terminals that can use chip 
because- and point to point and encryption. But again, that's going to be for another day because we are <laughs> going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we I go. I hope you all find it as fascinating as I do. <laughs> well, you know, if I think people are are excited to hear about this because it literally saved them money, and uh, the hot tip of not accepting virtual credit cards from insurance companies was awesome. So I, I have, I yeah. So I have uh, include. I, I will include your contact information in the video description. So if anyone wants to reach out to you, they can. Mm -hmm. uh, we had you look at our merchant statement free of charge and that's something free. yeah that's yes. something that's that's something that you do which is amazing so if you know what is really cool is that if you feel that you could save us money then you would say okay we'll work together but if you think that we're doing a good job or our credit card processing company is doing a good job then you mm -hmm. say well you you guys are good you don't need our services right because we if you don't need help, then we can't help you. It's really, it's actually a beautiful model. And like I said, I've been in merchant services. It's been almost 25 years, but I've worked with Merchant Advocate for almost 10 years now. And before I found Merchant Advocate, I wanted to leave the entire industry because I couldn't stand it. But now I get to use all that experience and knowledge to help you guys increase your bottom line. And Merchant Advocate, we don't, we just share in any savings that we generate for you. So if we can lower your costs, then great. There's more money in your pocket and we share in that. And that's the only way that we make any money is by helping you guys. If, if we don't save money, you don't make money. That's, that's really the bottom line for right. Merchant Advocate. That's the way I, my simple mind thinks. If mm -hmm. we are not saving money, you don't make any money. Exactly. So wonderful. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, co your contact information is down below. Thank you so much, uh, Cheryl, for sharing your amazing wealth of knowledge to help us save money on merchant processing fees. You are welcome. Thank you so much for having me and letting me talk to everyone today. All right. All right, folks. Thank you so much for watching. And if you, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll be happy to forward these to Cheryl or you can reach out to her via her email and she is so kind to leave her cell phone in the video uh, description. So feel free to uh, reach out to her directly. She will respond to you. She's very actually very responsive, which is kind of unusual for some merchants in this day and age. So anyway, have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye-bye.